Have you ever wondered what the top 10 things you should eat and drink while you're here in London are? Today, I'm gonna to run you down the top 10 things you absolutely have to try while you're visiting the UK capital. My name is Jessica, and I'm one of the tour guides by, for free tours by Foot London. I've been guiding food tours in London's East End for nearly a decade now, and I absolutely love talking about the history and culture of food. I love tasting food as well, because I think it's absolutely the best way to explore history. If you like this, video please give it a like and follow us and also make sure to watch our East End food tour video. Uh, also if you enjoy this tour make sure that you can always give me a tip. My PayPal link is below it's jessicatourguide at gmail.com. Now let's get started. Number 10 on our list is something that Britonic people have been eating for thousands and thousands of years. Oysters. Now, if you travel to other cities in the world, you're gonna find oysters. Some of my personal favorites are from the coast of British Columbia, where I'm from, and also from Kushis from Japan. New Zealand oysters are great. New Orleans oysters are great. Oysters are everywhere. But London's oysters have a particular bit of lore. The Romans thought that um, British oysters from the Thames estuary nearby are some, were some of the best in the entire Roman Empire. They loved them so much that they would dry them and preserve them, and they had them shipped all over the Roman Empire. You gotta remember that back then, even though today we think of London as a very sophisticated city, London, or Londinium as the Romans called it, was kind of the Wild West of the Roman Kingdom. It was one of the last places to be incorporated into the Roman Empire in AD 48, and one of the first to fall in the fourth century. But the oysters were a huge part of what Romans loved about England and London area in specific. Now I'm here at the aptly named English restaurant in East London, and we're gonna try one of these amazing Malden Rock oysters. There, I think about a two on the oyster size scale, maybe a, a three, and on top, I'm gonna to put a little bit of this mignonette, which is a vinegar and shallot or shallot mixture, and down the hatch. Mm. It's fresh, it's briny, um, taste of the sea, and it's absolutely delicious. Of course, I'm gonna finish that off with a sip of IPA. Number nine on our top 10 things to eat while you're in London is afternoon tea, where sometimes you're gonna hear people call it high tea. Now, is that just having a cup of tea in the afternoon? No. Uh, Having an afternoon tea is like a whole big thing. Uh, it, it, first of all, let's go back in time to the history. Anna, Duchess of Bedford, used to get hungry in the afternoons around four o'clock. This is in around 1840. So she would ask her servants to bring her a selection of little sandwiches, cakes, a pot of tea. And she was such a trendsetter at the time that when people would come over to her palatial home, they would enjoy this three or four o'clock snack, um, kind of tiered platters of little tasty things to eat and drink. And because people wanted to emulate her, they started doing it themselves. And it spread. Really, it is something traditional amongst the highest upper classes in London. And so if you really want to splash out and go for a high afternoon tea, you're going to need to dress up and probably go to one of London's five star hotels. But thankfully, there's a lot of budget friendly options up there out there. I've seen afternoon teas, which by the way, are usually all you can eat. So it's kind of a good value. They don't call them all you can eat, but you can always ask for more things to refill your little plates on the pedestal. Uh, you can get kind of budget discount afternoon teas for 15, 20 pounds sometimes. And of course you can always just go for a cream tea, which is a pot of tea with some scones, clotted cream and jam on top. So kind of getting a little bit of sweet and a pot of tea for a much better price between five and 10 quid for that. Now, uh, afternoon teas have also become really popular in the last couple of years as themed experiences. You can go for a potion making Harry Potter afternoon tea. You can go for a wild and wacky Alice in Wonderland high tea, Lego high tea for the kids. Anything themed you can think of, you can get an afternoon tea that way. Um, we've got a couple of blogs on our site so you can check out the different options options and when you are in town you can always ask me for a suggestion as well I love to do it
At number eight on our list, Victoria Sponge. Now I know we've already talked about afternoon tea and the little cakes and petty forests that you get, but I wanna focus in on one of those cakes that you're likely to see on your afternoon tea platter, Victoria Sponge. Victoria Sponge is said to have been one of Queen Victoria's favorite afternoon snacks. And in fact, Anna, Duchess of Bedford, was one of her ladies in waiting. And she adopted Anna's favorite afternoon tea herself by the 1850s. It was something Queen Victoria herself liked to do. Victoria Sponge is possible because of the invention in 1843 of baking powder. Baking powder allowed sponge to be created with butter instead of only eggs. Sponge cakes had been made using whisked eggs since the Middle Ages, but with the invention of baking powder, it would rise fluffy and light, and with the butter, we finally get this amazing cake base for Victoria Sponge. The yellow sponge cake is layered, as you can see, with cream and fruit jam, and I often see it year round, but it's really popular in the summertime, I think because of its association with those summer fruits. So even if you don't go for afternoon tea, make sure that you get a slice of Victoria sponge and you can drink it with a cup of tea and it can be your own little afternoon indulgence while you're visiting the capital. Coming in at number seven, we have a dish that you have to have some nerves to try. That is, unless you're born and raised in East London, and then you'll be well familiar with jellied eels. You heard me correct, jellied eels. Eels, the long, skinny, snake-like fish, were the only type of fish that could thrive in the polluted Thames in the 19th century, the Thames River nearby. As a result, jellied eels became a beloved East End snack served cold in their own jelly, kind of like an aspic with a piece of buttered bread on the side, or sometimes served hot with a sauce called liquor. Now that's not alcohol. Liquor is a parsley and eel broth that's ladled on top of your eels. You can also have an eel pie. In fact, there's an entire part of London called Eel Pie Island. Eel pies were really popular Victorian snacks people would grab an eel pie and take it on their picnic. And this was a beloved thing to eat on the weekends. To this day, there's still a few places in East London where you can get jelly eels, but I have to admit, with changing tastes, they're not as popular as they used to be. Here at SR Kelly, you can still get a good jelly eel. By the way, if you want to use Cockney rhyming slang, you can say, you and me, we've got a jelly eel. And that's Cockney rhyming slang for We've got a deal. All right, we're here at number six on our top 10 list of British foods you have to try while you're in London. And we cannot write this list without including the full English breakfast, or just commonly called a full English. A full English is a huge plate of breakfast. Uh, it's a little bit different than the American or Canadian or even Australian breakfast plate. And it's really different than most European breakfast plates and Asian breakfast plates and African breakfast plates. What is on it? Well, first of all, some familiar things if you're American or Canadian. Like, you know, you're going to see an egg, some toast, maybe some breakfast meats like sausage or bacon. But that's where the similarities end. What you're going to see on an English breakfast plate, full English, is an egg fried. Toast, maybe fried in bacon fat, maybe just toasted. Beans, yes, tinned beans, Heinz tinned beans to be exact. Tomato, fried or maybe just raw, sometimes given a little bit of fry on the griddle. It's gonna have some mushroom, maybe some chopped up button mushrooms or a whole half of a portobello mushroom. It doesn't matter, mushrooms have gotta be on that plate. Then you've got your rasher of bacon, but bacon in the UK is usually what we would call back bacon in North America. It is a back bacon piece, often unsmoked, but it could be smoked. You're also gonna have a sausage, probably a Cumberland sausage, maybe a Lincolnshire sausage. It's got a really nice, herby, savory flavor inside and a little bit of breadcrumbs added for a really good kind of soft mouthfeel after you pop through that sausage skin. What else is on that plate? Black pudding. No, it's not a, a sweet. Black pudding or blood sausage is a traditional round of sausage made with pork blood and as well as bread crumbs and onions and herbs. It's really delicious. If you are feeling a little bit afraid of it, please 
give it a try. Uh, and all of these things are going to be on your English breakfast plate. If you go other parts of the country, like Wales, like Scotland, even in parts of Ireland, you're going to have different things added or subtracted. You might have some kippers, you might have some seaweed bread in Wales, but the things that I've mentioned are the standard items in a full English. Now, if you want to have a great full English while you're here in London, you can go somewhere a bit hipstery, like the Breakfast Club. They also do eggs, bennies, and pancake, American style pancakes and things like that. Or if you want to be extra authentic, you can go to a traditional calf. There's nothing better than Palichis, which is on Bethnal Green Road. E. Palichi has been around since 1915, and they serve up some amazing traditional working class full English breakfast. So much so that Anthony Bourdain actually ate there when he was here in London. Coming in at number five is my personal favorite, Sunday roast. Now, when I say Sunday roast, I'm referring to a roast beef lunch or dinner eaten somewhere between about noon and four or five o'clock. Roast beef or other kinds of roast meats or even vegetarian options served with all of the trimmings. And it's something usually that you eat with friends or family. Sunday roast became really popular during the reign of Henry VII at the end of the 15th century. It was a personal favorite of his. And at the time, the guards at the Tower of London began getting the nickname beef eaters because they could afford to buy roast beef. Roast beef was extremely popular, cooked over an open flame, open fire. Now these days, roast beef isn't cooked necessarily over an open fire, although that sounds delicious. It is usually cooked in the oven. You can put everything into the oven. And in the earlier part of this century, and still for some people, people would put their vegetables and their meat in the oven before they went to church. And then when they came back from church services, it would be nice and ready to eat. Today, a lot of people go to the pub for a Sunday roast. It's a really nice tradition, a nice place to enjoy it. And pubs all over London and all over the country have really, really good Sunday roasts. Now, the most important part of a Sunday roast, of course, the beef. Actually, did you know that the French have nicknamed the English le roast boeuf because of all the roast beef they think we eat? But the beef, of course, is important. Or the chicken or the pork or the veg option. But even more important, in my opinion, are the roast potatoes. Crunchy and delicious. Lashings of gravy. And who could forget Yorkshire puddings. Now, Yorkshire puddings is not sweet. It's not a, a dessert. The Yorkshire pudding is a personal souffle, a uh, savory that you get on your plate. And it's perfect for mopping up all of that gravy and soaking up the horseradish and really tying the whole meal together. Yorkshire puddings only usually available on Sundays at pubs and they are fantastic. This is my biggest recommendation of something to do if you are here in London on a Sunday. Go for a roast at a great pub. All right, at number four, we've got pie and mash. We're back here at SR Kelly and Sons. This shop was originally founded in 1915 by Matilda Kelly and they're still serving up her classic recipe for a mince beef pie with mashed potato and gravy. Wait, did I just say gravy? Well, it's usually a matter of personal preference, but I'll be honest. Gravy is usually what you get with pie and mash in a pub or in the north of the country. Here in the East End and at SR Kelly's, it's more typical to get pie and mash with something called liquor, which is the parsley and eel sauce that I mentioned earlier when talking about jellied eels. Pie and mash was a really popular working class Victorian food. Victorians loved this combination because it gives you a lot of energy, it's really filling, and of course, it was really affordable. And pie and mash shops popped up all over the country, particularly in working class areas. Now, of course, today tastes have changed a little bit, so we are seeing a decline in the number of traditional pie and mash shops in London. The good news, you can get pie and mash at every grocery store, at every pub, and even at some Michelin-starred restaurants. But these traditional shops, they are dwindling down. So the, when you're in London, come on my tour. We're gonna come and support one or just go and visit one on your own. You can have a Google and check. They're usually found in Southeast London and in East London in the East End. Pie and mash, 
one of the must try British foods when you're in London. Coming in at number three is a British food that you're only going to really find done well in the east end of London, and that is a salt beef bagel. Yes, you heard me say that correctly. I wasn't trying to say bagel, I was trying to say bagel. Bagel is the traditional Yiddish pronunciation for bagel or bagel. I've heard some people say a bagel is a boiled round bread with a hole in the middle. And the Eastern European Ashkenazi Jewish immigrants to London's East End in the 19th century brought with them their tradition, not only of these delicious bagels, but also of salt beef. Now you might be thinking, what's it? That looks a lot like corned beef, Jessica. What's the difference between corned beef and salt beef? To corn is a verb to say to salt something. So corned beef and salt beef, they're actually synonyms. This is a brisket simmered gently, a beef brisket simmered gently with salt, pepper, bay, and onion for at least four, six, even eight hours to make it juicy and tender. It's also using a special pickling salt called saltpeter, which is a nitrite, and that gives it its kind of bouncy texture. Now, a salt beef bago, you'll see people queuing up for them, lining up for them all day and all night. That's because the bagel bag here is a 24-hour bagel shop. It's one of the rare 24-hour places in London where you can get delicious, fresh, hot food. Now, let's go in for this bagel. We've got salt beef, the bagel, which is a little bit softer than an American bagel, a Montreal bagel or a New York bagel. You've also got some yellow English mustard. This is incredibly hot in your sinuses, like wasabi, similar to horseradish. There's a reason why they used mustard gas in warfare. Mustard has a really pungent flavor and English mustard really gets you right in the nose. My grandfather used to say it's like a shot of whiskey. And finally, some sweet cucumber gherkins. Gherkin is the British way of saying a cucumber pickle. Normally, a Jewish pickle is salty and sour, but British taste likes sweet gherkin, sweet pickle. So over the century and a half, this has actually become a sweet pickle, and I think it works fantastic on this sandwich. You get sweet, salty, savory, sour, umami. All the taste buds are taken care of. Let's give a bite to this salt beef bagel. This is always one of the most popular items on my East End food tour. I haven't had one in a couple of weeks, a couple of months, I should say. Absolutely delicious. There's a reason why people queue up for these. This is definitely a British food you have to try while you're in London. Number two on the list, chicken tikka masala. That's right, this dish has become the number one takeaway dish in the UK. Sometimes it even beats out pizza, fish and chips, and Chinese takeaways, which are all really popular. Now, chicken tikka masala is one of the most beloved uh, British curry dishes. And I used to live in India for a long time. You can get chicken tikka masala at nearly every restaurant there. But where was it invented? Birmingham. <laughs> of all places. It was submitted in Birmingham. Some people say Glasgow, but most common consensus is that it was a Bangladeshi restaurant owner catering to British postal workers. And the postal workers were complaining that they were getting too much like acid reflux or heartburn from the spicy curry that he was serving them. So instead, he decided to take a Punjabi dish, butter chicken masala, and kind of dial back the heat and amplify up the sweetness and the creaminess. He added butter, cream, and tinned tomato soup. Yes, you heard me correctly. To the dish, and he created chicken tikka masala. It was such a huge hit. People kept coming back for more that other restaurants started serving it up too. And like I said, it's now just as popular in India, Bangladesh, and Pakistan as it is here in the UK. Now, I'm here on Brick Lane in front of all these curry houses. You can check out some tikka masala here, or you can get it nearly anywhere in the country. Last but not least, number one on our list has got to be fish and chips. 
This is the number one most requested food that I get as a tour guide and people love to come from all over the world and try fish and chips and all over London too. Fish and chips are absolutely beloved, not only just here in Britain, but all over the Commonwealth. However, did you know that they have a international origin and history? It's true. Back in the 1860s, fish and chips were referred to as fish fried in the Jewish style. The first chip shop was opened by a Russian Jewish immigrant called Joseph Malin. For more about the history of fish and chips, watch our East End food tour video and you're gonna learn all about them. Now, these fish and chips I've gotten from one of the number one rated chip shops or chippies in all of London and yes, all of the UK. And that's Poppy's across the street here in Hanbury Street in East London. I've chosen today to have some cod bites, which is a white fish cod battered in the delicious batter and a side of chips. Now remember, these aren't fries. They're chips. We have fries in the UK. They're skinny and crispy, but chips are soft and fat. These ones are covered in vinegar, by the way. If you see a glisten on them, that's not oil, it's vinegar, because I love to put almost too much malt vinegar, barley vinegar, on my chip, fish and chips. Crispy and soft, this is exactly the way that a chip should be. Now let's just check out some of this homemade tartar sauce that they have. You can see I've already been into that. I'm gonna dip my cod bite in there. Just listen for this crunch. Mm. It always seems like I'm hamming it up for the camera when I take a bite of a cod bite, but I promise I'm not. They are that good. People on tours before have said to me, wow, you really look like you're enjoying those. And I do. If you come to London, do not get your fish and chips from a pub. Pubs have mediocre fish and chips. They have exactly the type of fish and chips you think they'd have to serve drunk people. If you want authentic, real, traditional fish and chips, you've got to come to a chip shop. And Poppy's is the best. So there you have it. Those are just 10 of the things that you need to eat when you visit London. If you're a foodie like me and you love exploring a city through its tastes, its flavors, its little um, restaurants, bars, pubs, then London is the city for you. When you're here, make sure you book one of our food tours and ask us for more recommendations and information. As tour guides, we absolutely love to tell you about our favorite places to eat and drink. So until I see you in London on one of my tours, thanks so much for watching. Love.